Okay, uh, thank you very much for the kind introduction. I hope you can uh, hear me now. So um, my name is um, Philipp Steiner. Um, I'm from the Institute of uh, Pharmacology here at the JKU. And today I'd like to um, talk with you about autostructural visualization of immune cells after pharmacological impairment. So first of all, um, I'd like to give you a very brief introduction to immune cells and to the immune system um, due to the current um, pandemic situation. Kind of everybody is an immunologist uh, nowadays. Um, so very briefly, we have the innate immunity, which is uh, unspecific and has a very rapid response, and the adaptive immunity, uh, which is specific with a slow response. And uh, today in this talk, we are focusing on um, basophils. So each uh, immunity has a um, subgroup of immune cells, and we're focusing on basophils and mast cells. <clears throat> so right away, um, more specifically, um, we're working with uh, a cell line called red basophilic leukemia cells, or short RBL1. Um, These uh, cell lines are often used as a model for primary mast cells. We're also working with primary green mast cells, but here we're focusing on this um, cell line. Um, both basophils and mast cells are innate um, effector cells of allergic reactions and are therefore very interesting for us as uh, pharmacologists. So right here we have um, two images. Those are um, two-dimensional transmission electron microscopic images of an RBL1 cell and the mast cell. So um, more specific, we are working with um, cation channels, um, especially the two-port channel, um, TPC1. Um, this is uh, called after the uh, characteristic um, two pore regions here. And this two-port channel um, actually plays a very important role in um, the calcium homeostasis of intracellular organelles such as endosomes and lysosomes, but also um, the R, the endoplasmic um, reticulum, and also the interaction in between uh, endolysosomes and the R. Um, it was previous, previously um, shown that a pharmacologic uh, inhibition or genetic ablation, a knockout of TPC1 results in an enhanced anaphylactic response in uh, mice. For the pharmacological part, um, the plant alkaloid tetradrine is very uh, interesting because the tetradrine uh, is known to be acting as an inhibitor of um, those uh, two pore channels. So, um, very brief, I would like to. Um, to uh, get into this um, graph. So um, if we have an allergen exposition, for example, um, this triggers a uh, signal cascade very roughly, and um, the signal cascade um, um, therefore triggers um, the release of calcium out of the endoplasmatic reticulum, which is very essential for the um, calcium homeostasis inside the cell. And this um, provokes um, histamine release out of the cell, which again uh, triggers a regulated um, anaphylactic uh, response. So this is a regulated uh, process and partly it is regulated by the endolysosomes. So here we have the endolysosome, which is in a close spatial proximity to the ER. And um, by those two pore channels, um, the endolysosome actually um, regulates um, the amount of uh, intercellular calcium by in uh, uptake or release of uh, calcium in the endolysosome. So if we um, block these uh, channels, uh, for example, with the plant alkaloid tetron bean, um, there will be no regulation and there is a higher amount of calcium inside the ER. And if again, um, this uh, cascade here is triggered by an allergen, for example, <clears throat> then there is a higher release of calcium out of the ER. And this um, actually leads to an enhanced anaphylactic response um, for example, in uh, mice. So the physiological um, background here is quite uh, well established, but however, there is a lack of autostructural um, knowledge that underlies these processes. And therefore we're working with uh, um, different electron microscopic uh, methods. Uh, and this set of methods um, could help clarify um, in this matter. So for us, there are actually um, two important questions. First of all, um, are there um, sites, contact sites between the ER and the endolysosome and our controls, are they visible? 
And if we um, um, block our uh, channels, um, do they lose those convex sites? So very brief electron microscopy, um, why are we using electron microscopy? Um, the wavelength is actually essential for um, the resolution. If you um, take the wavelength of green light, for example, it's about roughly um, 550 nanometers. Um, and if you take the wavelength of an accelerated electron, um, it has a resolution of 0 0.004 nanometers, so very high resolution in theory. In a more practical way, um, electron microscopy, especially cryo-electron microscopy, is, uh, enables us to obtain data sets and images uh, with a resolution up to two angstroms or even um, less. So, um, yeah. Basically, you can subdivide electron microscopy in scanning electron microscopy and transmission electron uh, microscopy. We are working here with transmission electron microscopy or short TEM. Um, this method uses irradiation of an uh, ultra thin uh, section by an electron uh, beam and therefore enables us the visualization and det uh, det uh, detection of uh, molecules uh, and uh, autostructure in general. <clears throat> For um, this uh, procedure, or again, in general, for electron microscopy, fixation is very important. Uh, fixation and preparation of the samples is, uh, in general, the key to a high quality um, EM. I would also uh, characterize um, our workflow and our fixation workflow um, very briefly. And um, I already mentioned cryo-electron microscopy, and I would like to highlight that the Nobel Prize in Chemistry uh, in 2017 was awarded to Dubuchet, Frank, and Henderson for um, the invention and development of uh, cryo-electron microscopy. So very brief, our workflow. So we're working with the red basophilic leukemia um, control cells and cells treated with the plant, alkaloid um, tetron green. Um, we have to fix our cells. Um, we are high pressure freezing our cells and uh, cryo substitute them. So this is a very um, state of the art uh, fixation method. And afterwards the cells are going to be embedded, uh, trimmed. So we have single sections to almost two dimensional sections, um, which are, um, which are going to be positioned on these grids. So there's a grid right here, and here we have those little um, sections. Um, I would like you to keep this uh, grid uh, in your mind for a little bit longer. This uh, grid is going to be transferred into the electron microscope where we are going to implement um, our two-dimensional and three-dimensional methods um, to obtain two-dimensional micrographs and three-dimensional um, tromographs. So speaking of this um, grid, this is a size comparison. Um, the grid uh, has approximately the diameter of um, the tip of a pencil, approximately. And on this grid, we have these uh, single trapezoid um, sections. So we are using ribbons of these uh, sections, which is essential for the three-dimensional tomography. And on, this, uh, on each section, there are our cells, our RBL1 cells. And this is actually a very low magnification overview of one cell. If we go into detail, we have here an RBL1 uh, control. And if you uh, recalled uh, one of our main questions, we can observe now <clears throat> that there are actually um, contact points between the endolysosome, so here we have the endolysosome, and DER. And if we treat our cells now with um, the plant alkaloid um, tetranrin, these um, interaction or contact uh, points between the endolysosome and the R are no longer visible in our two-dimensional data. And this is very surprisingly for us, but obviously the endolysosomes appear um, bloated in our tetranrin treated cells. So once again, um, this endolysis some of a control appears to be bloated or uh, extended probably 10 to 15 times bigger in our tetron dream controls. Um, we are also using three-dimensional TM tomography. Um, here in blue, there's the ER and yellow, there's the endolysosome um, to get a, a better understanding of those um, contact points. And actually, um, our data shows that these are not just contact points, but um, whole surface areas that are actually enveloping, so whole um, surface points of the ER that, is, uh, that are enveloping um, the endolysosome right here. So therefore, three-dimensional electron uh, microscopic tomography is very essential um, to characterize these structures. 
In our um, RBL1 um, that we treated cells, again, we see the um, bloated uh, endolysosomes, and uh, there are no such um, surface uh, areas in our treatment. So there's definitely um, also in other um, uh, section areas, in other um, Z stacks of the sections, there is no contact. I mean, there's a spatial proximity, of course, of the ER to the endolysosome, but there are no um, contact points. And this is a comparison of the both with the same um, scale. So this brings us uh, to the conclusion that our um, two-dimensional, especially three-dimensional um, ultrastructural investigations um, show a large uh, interaction surfaces, not just points, but surfaces between ER and endolysosomes, which cannot be seen after um, the pharmacological inhibition um, of TPC1 with tetron dream. Um, Moreover, I have to again highlight that the three-dimensional um, investigation is very, very powerful tool um, for these uh, for the determination of the structure. Um, previously, there were um, investigations that also focused on two-dimensional data, and this could actually lead into a misinterpretation. In terms of the bloating of the endolysis zones, um, recently uh, there was a discussion of an osmotic um, phenotypic effect. So this could um, rather than an ionic effect also being a smotic uh, effect or a combination of um, both. We now know only that it is not um, fusion. Um, fusion should uh, be uh, down-regulated during the treatment of uh, TPC. So we more or think it's a bloating effect due to osmotic um, <clears throat> parameters or also ionic parameters. Um, this is a very clear, quick um, outlook to some of our ongoing investigations. So we would also like to um, to focus on the elementary composition of calcium in the individual organelles with a structural reference. Um, we therefore work with the University in Salzburg, where we are performing electron um, energy loss spectroscopy. Um, at the Zona, we are performing energy dispersive um, X-ray analysis, and we are currently working on a cryo EM and EX method in a collaboration with um, Fiantem Fischer and the Vienna Biocenter. And of course, correlative light and electron microscopic methods could be beneficial um, to, for this task. And we are also focusing on the determination and localization of TPC1 in general, but also the contact points between the uh, endolysis cells. And um, the R, um, we're working with immune cytochemical um, methods, EM methods. We already have some very interesting um, compounds, but um, this is some of our ongoing investigations. To sum it up, um, our um, findings with uh, different electron microscopic methods in uh, combination with molecular biological, also physiological and immunological experiments could help clarify whether TPCs um, are indeed promising pharmacological um, targets for the treatment of diseases such as um, allergic hypersensitivity, but also other diseases. Um, and in summary, we aim at a better understanding of the role of TPC um, in the regulation of the crosstalk um, between ER and analyzer sounds at an ultrastructural um, level. So at last, um, for those of you who have read the synopsis of my talk, I was also mentioning SARS-CoV-2. So to be honest, this was more or less a little bit of a clickbait. We are currently not working with um, SARS-CoV-2, but um, the TPC community does. So TPC is very essential um, for um, SARS-CoV-2 uh, infection. Um, there are numerous uh, studies uh, going on right now, and uh, for the last electron microscopic uh, image, I would like to show you um, this uh, two-dimensional DM image uh, by the Robert Koch Institute, where we can see the um, coronavirus with the typical spike protein corona. And this is extracellular, intracellular, there is the coronavirus in some uh, endocytotic um, compartments, uh, endosomes, and lysosomes. And as you now, um, all of you know that um, the endosomes and endolysosomes comprise two pore channels in their plasma membrane. And this could be um, promising future targets also for the treatment um, maybe for SARS-CoV-2. So with that um, said, I'm at the end of my talk. I'd like to um, thank uh, my colleagues at the Institute of Pharmacology, um, especially Professor, Professor Susanna Zieler. She's the head of the Institute here. Uh, my colleagues, also our collaboration partners at the LMU in Munich and University in Salzburg, 
um, Heiko Groys and his team at the Zona. And I'd like to thank the Linz Institute of um, Technology for your for the invitation. And I thank you all for your attention. And I'm looking forward to hopefully answer your question now.